I can't think of anybody more important than Eric Posner, uh, who has written innumerable books among innumerable subjects um, and constitutional, international law. It's just a polymath of, of surveys. And one of the questions that, that faced us, and we haven't spoken about this because the risks are not only among the banks. So somewhere in the audience here is our newest member, uh, Western and Southern, Jim Vance, who traded Ameribor yesterday in the first insurance company. Um, we've, we've got um, other non-banks, uh, Burke Malik from Cerberus, who's, you know, contributed to Ameribor. We've got Brian Mandarola and Mr. Crucia, Bob, uh, who from, come from Hartford, that these indexes don't only affect the banking right, the industry, they affect insurance companies who have a, an important input into this process. And, and this is something that, again, we hope to have by convening this group. Eric is going to have a, uh, uh, as again, as a sidebar to say, okay, what are, what's the litigation history here? What are the legal risks? Much what Dr. David Bowman said, what happens if you continue to use it? Are you at peril if you write a swap that matures in 2028? Using LIBOR, do you have backup language to, as a contingency? Are you writing your contracts differently? What about the tail of, of 10 or 20 percent of the swaps that go past 2021? And I hope we can get some insight about what a new contract might look like and what the legal implications are. Please join me in welcoming a colleague, Eric Posner. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so I, th I know this is a sleepy part of the afternoon, so I thought I would talk to you about scandal. Not Stormy Daniels, uh, although if you want my view about the non-disclosure agreement, I'd be happy to tell you what I think <laughs> during the break. But these scandals are even more uh, terrifying in a way. They involve, for example, foreign currency, gold, palladium, milk, oil, biofuels, natural gas, aluminum, and interest rates. These are benchmark scandals. And in all of these cases, there was significant litigation arising from allegations that a benchmark was manipulated. People went to jail. People lost their jobs. Institutions paid millions or billions of dollars in damages or settlements. So I'm uh, starting from the opposite uh, perspective from Randy. Uh, Randy starts with Hayek and, and uh, um, uh, how uh, spontaneous order arises, and I'm talking about spontaneous disorder. So you have these private institutions that arise, and then somehow chaos erupts, um, contrary to what people expected when they developed these benchmarks in the first place. <coughs> so let me start with a little bit of background. I want to try to explain why benchmark scandals have been so frequent and important. And here I'm going to echo a little bit what um, uh, earlier speakers said, but I'm, I'm going to give it a little different spin. So um, there are lots of reasons why benchmarks are set up. People are generally familiar with them by now. Uh, they serve all kinds of useful purposes in uh, financial markets. But the key point I want to make is what, that when people set up benchmarks, they usually do it for fairly narrow purposes relating to their specific business. They're not doing it for public regarding uh, reasons. Uh, Richard, Richard may be an exception here, but generally speaking, they're not doing it for public regarding reasons. So LIBOR, for example, the origin apparently uh, goes back to the 1960s. This is a famous story. A banker in the UK was setting up an $80 million syndicated loan to Iran. And he and others agreed that the loan had to be a floating rate loan. And the question arose, when the rate resets, 
you know, what are you going to use as, as the benchmark? And his idea was simply to use uh, the cost of funds of the participating banks. They would disclose their cost of funds right before uh, the reset, and this would be averaged, and, and the new rate would, would be developed. And this ultimately led to the development of LIBOR, which reflects a similar uh, relatively narrow business purpose for the uh, panel banks uh, that were involved. Now, a key part of this is that because uh, the banks disclose their cost of funds, the general public hears about it. And so the, and this is a lot like the Lighthouse example uh, that Tom uh, brought up earlier. The, the benchmark um, is, the, the, the disclosure part of the benchmark has a, has a specific purpose. It makes it more difficult for the panel banks or the employees of the panel banks to manipulate. If their submission is disclosed, everybody sees what they are and they might be able to discover manipulation. But by the same token, the rest of the market can use this information if it wants and the rest of the market can do so. And the result is that uh, lots of people end up using a benchmark not necessarily because of the intentions of the people who set up and operate uh, the benchmark. And that's where uh, legal exposure uh, begins. Now, benchmarks are set up in many different ways. Uh, people have already talked about some of the trade-offs. Randy did, for example. There's a trade-off, for example, between uh, keying your benchmark to market transactions, as Richard is doing, and using some kind of judgment uh, or discretion-based um, approach, the way LIBOR does. Now, of course, they're usually a kind of a hybrid. In the case of LIBOR, the submitters are supposed to be representing market transactions to the extent they can, but to the extent that the market transactions run out, they're not enough, then they're supposed to use their judgment based on perhaps transactions that occurred earlier and general market uh, conditions. And as Randy and I were discussing, this generates information that's useful for people, including the banks involved. You have a benchmark even for relatively illiquid parts of the market. Even beyond this general trade-off here, uh, you have um, decisions that have to be made. So, for example, if you have a market-based benchmark, you have to decide uh, all kinds of things, like what's the time interval for the transactions that you use uh, for uh, the benchmark, um, what is the r range of types of transactions you can use. And I gather from that SOFR uses a bunch of different types of transactions and statistical methods to try to take into account the differences between them. Uh, but at some point, the broader the basis of the benchmark gets, the less you might lose uh, accuracy with respect to the underlying economic variable that you care about, right? So there's a trade-off there as well. And with respect to the judgment-based uh, benchmarks, there are devices that can be used to reduce the risk of manipulation and to ga cabin the error that results from people using their judgment rather than relying solely on market transactions. So for Li LIBOR itself, you know how they do it. They throw out the outliers and take the average, and that should reduce the amount of noise including the risk of, of manipulation. Now, the only point I'm trying to make here is that whenever you send up, set up a benchmark, this is not a scientific process. It's a, it's a judgment. It reflects judgments. And these judgments could be wrong. Uh, and the benchmark could be OK, but not ideal. In fact, no benchmark will ever be ideal. Now, we might say, well, that, that's not a big deal. We could have multiple benchmarks. People could use different benchmarks. The market will choose the best benchmarks. You're never going to have perfection in any event. But there's another problem. And this problem has to do with the value that benchmarks have for coordinating different economic actors. So in the original syndicated loan to Iran, Part of the issue was having the different banks in the syndicate use the same interest rate, right? So there had to be coordination and, and providing Iran with reasonable expectations about what, where their interest rates might go. But of course, now in financial markets, the coordination is vastly greater and more sophisticated. So once people are using LIBOR or any other particular benchmark for a range of loans, then of course people are going to want to hedge those loans, which means that there's going to be a demand for derivatives that use the same benchmark. And so a benchmark can quickly become entrenched, right? And there's a sense in which the private agents who are setting up the benchmark are acting as a bit as if they were government 
because, the, because of the natural way in which the benchmark will become, in effect, mandatory. Not, not, you know, not mandatory in the sense that there's a legal mandate to use it, but mandatory in the sense that if you want to be in some market, you've got to use LIBOR because that's what everybody else in the market is using. That's what they're expecting. You're stuck. Economists call this a pooling equilibrium. But whatever you call it, the bottom line is we start with benchmarks that are necessarily less than ideal. And then there's this time component. And, and uh, Randy used the nice analogy of the Arctic Circle. It's shifting. And the same way, markets can shift. And so the sorts of transactions that are used to determine a benchmark might become less important over time. And then the benchmark will, again, become less ideal. And yet it's also entrenched, right? Th this is a significant problem that we're now seeing with, with LIBOR. <laughs> So market uh, actors are stuck with these benchmarks. Um, of course, they're valuable, but they're also uh, dangerous. And of course, the, one of the main dangers is that they're vulnerable to manipulation. And there's an interesting point to be made here. So market manipulation has always been a problem. There are all kinds of ways to manipulate the market. Economists have tended to be skeptical in general about market manipulation. They acknowledge that it's theoretically possible, but it's really difficult. If I want to, for example, manipulate the silver market, as has been tried, you know, I could try to buy up all the silver in the world, or most of it, jack up the price, and then sell really quickly. You know, theoretically, that's possible. In practice, it's incredibly risky and expensive. That's the point that the economists make about ordinary types of market manipulation. But if a benchmark exists, it becomes a lot easier to manipulate the market, because now you just have to be someone who can influence the benchmark. And if you can influence the benchmark either directly or by manipulating the limited number of transactions that the benchmark is based on, then you'll know the future, right? And you can always make money if you know the future. So let's turn to LIBOR now and see how this has played out. Uh, so um, LIBOR, so what, LIBOR is being discontinued, and I guess um, one of the points that was made was probably it's just because these banks are not engaging in uh, so much interbank lending anymore for various uh, reasons. But behind all this, the trader abuse scandal clearly hurt LIBOR, and also the the uh, suppression of LIBOR during the financial crisis. And and I want to talk a little bit about these things. So let's start with the trader abuse. So the trader manipulation of uh, LIBOR was incredibly simple and illegal. So all that the traders did, all that the traders did, you know, a trader in a panel bank would call up the submitter and say, "Hey, would you mind submitting uh, the quote? You know, a little bit high or a little bit low?" And then the submitter would say, "Sure." Uh, and, and I'll quote you one of these. These messages, of course, were all recorded. One of them, which was um, quoted in the, in the settlement. So this is from a trader. We have another big fixing tomorrow. And I was hoping we could get the one month and three month LIBORs as high as possible. So that was it. That's your manipulation. And the submitter says, OK, a little bit higher. Uh, so. This is clearly illegal. It's, it's called manipulation. There are statutes in the US and the UK and everywhere that prohibits this type of behavior. Um, but an interesting point, at least I want to make a, a, a slightly contrarian point, and, and I think David Bowman might, might agree with this from something you suggested. It wasn't really a big deal. Um, and, and, and the reason why it wasn't a big deal is, first of all, what they did was obviously illegal. A lot of the things that are big deals are legal but shouldn't be legal. This was obviously illegal. The traders, what they were doing, they were easy to catch because everything they said was re recorded. What they were doing, by the way, was also against the interests of their own employers. The banks didn't want their traders manipulating LIBOR. In many cases, the traders uh, you know, the trader's incentives were not even aligned with the bank. The bank might be short or long LIBOR. The trader was not necessarily uh, uh, had the same interest in LIBOR going up or down. So the banks uh, were not happy about this and, and, and turned over the traders happily to the authorities. And finally, 
just by the nature of the way LIBOR works, the traders weren't really able to cause that much harm. They did make money, which was a lot by the standards of a, of a person, but not uh, by the standards of the financial system. They had to keep the manipulation small, because if it was large, anybody could have seen it almost immediately. And then in addition, the traders were manipulating both up and down. So for most people, that netted out to nothing. Uh, and so there was probably relatively harm, relatively little harm, uh, from this type of abuse. But the, the, the larger point here is that this type of manipulation is almost inevitable. Um, Dr. Bowman said that there are stronger uh, protections in place. I believe him, but I also think that someone's going to figure out, figure out a way around them in the future. Uh, okay, next. So the trader uh, abuse has to be distinguished be from what the banks did during the financial crisis. And this is a lot more important and interesting. Uh, so during the financial crisis, uh, as you all know, LIBOR was going up and people were concerned about this. But uh, a little bit behind the scenes, something more alarming was happened. So as, as, you, as has been mentioned several times, the bank's submissions are published, right? So LIBOR is itself just a number, a number for different currencies and uh, tenors. But you know, the number is published, but so is the, a list of what each bank submitted. So there's 16 or 20 banks, and, and their submissions are, are listed and are made public. Now, most of the time, during normal times, their submissions are pretty close, and nobody pays attention to them. But during the financial crisis, somebody noticed that Barclays was frequently uh, the highest uh, submitter, and that its submissions were you know, kind of outliers. You know, they were far away from the cluster of, 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 of the other banks. And this led to reports in the financial press asking whether Barclays might be in trouble. If they have the highest cost of funds, maybe they're the weakest of, the ma of these major banks. Now, of course, in the middle of a liquidity crisis, that's the last thing you want people to think about your bank. Because it's relatively cheap for people who are at least depositors and other people, short-term creditors, uh, to move their money from Barclays to some other bank. And if that happens, there'll be a run on Barclays. And this uh, information will produce the, this sort of self-fulfilling uh, destruction of the bank. And so Barclays responded. This time it was the management. So it was the bank itself, not these rogue traders. The management responded by instructing the submitters you know, to go down just a little bit. And they didn't say, you know, you should be the lowest in the pack so that everybody will think we're the best bank, right? They said, just don't be an outlier. It's OK to be high. And the term they used a few times was the head, the head above the parapet. You don't want to have your head above the parapet. Or to use another metaphor, if you're a sheep and wolves are prowling about, you want to be in the herd. You want to be in the middle of the herd. You don't want to be, you know, wandering off. Uh, chewing some grass somewhere. Uh, so, so, so Barclays got in tremendous trouble for this. Uh, and uh, you, some, I, you, I, I don't know whether this is broadly known, or I'm sure many of you know this, but not only did they have to settle with regulators and pay big fines, but they, along with all the other banks, are being sued by everybody in the world for all the money in the world, for trillions of dollars. And just hope that these lawsuits don't prevail. And I should disclose, by the way, that a few years ago, I did legal work for one of these uh, uh, banks. So I may not be unbiased. So why, 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 why all this liability? OK, and this is another sort of concern that people who are setting up uh, benchmarks should, should have, should think about. Well, they're being sued for fraud, for misstating the actual uh, cost of funds. Now, as Randy says, well, is it even possible to be honest? But there's something at least possibly fraud. If there are no transactions, is it possibly to be honest? But there's at least a, a fraud allegation. There's manipulation. Problem with fraud is that could mean punitive damages. There are antitrust claims. Problem with antitrust, that could mean treble damages. And in terms of the potential liability, the problem for the banks is they're being sued by different classes of people. Some of the, the plaintiffs are just the bank's own counterparties who complain that you know, they lent money to the banks uh, 
using uh, a LIBOR-based, uh, you know, uh, interest rate, and that was suppressed, so they got paid somewhat less interest than they should have. That's not the problem. The problem is, is the $300 trillion market. So uh, any one of your banks could have lent money to somebody, uh, variable rate mortgage keyed to LIBOR. Uh, the panel banks are not involved. They're not involved in the transaction at all. But then you make the argument, you're probably in this class, by the way, all of you. Uh, you make the argument that uh, because of the suppression, you received less interest rate from your debtor than you would have otherwise. And the banks are potentially liable to that, uh, to everybody for that. Notice, by the way, that your counterparty, the debtor, made money, right? It's just a transfer from, the, from you to the debtor, but that doesn't help the panel banks. The panel banks probably aren't, won't be able to you know, pay you guys a trillion dollars and then go after the debtors and get trillion dollars back from, that, from them. That probably won't work out, although it has a certain logic to it. It would, it would be a mess at, at, at the minimum, right? Like the banks would have to sue everybody in the world. You know. <clears throat> uh, OK. The irony in all this is it's not entirely clear what the bank should have done or even whether they acted improperly in the first place. This is, this is the argument that some of the banks are making. If the banks had been honest, what would that have meant? They could have said, well, we're not borrowing from each other because you know, we think that all of our counterparties might collapse at, at any moment. That wouldn't have been good. Uh, the submitter, who was just this sort of low-level employee, could have just you know, so well, we're not borrowing, so clearly the number's got to be really high, so I'll just put in a higher and higher number. That, of course, would have meant that everybody in the world who had a variable rate loan would have defaulted eventually, making the financial crisis all that much worse. And there are hints, at least allegations, that the governments of the UK and the US, when they found out about this, you know, they didn't think it was necessarily a terrible thing for the banks to be suppressing. Uh, but if that's not really a legal defense. And there's certainly uh, <laughs> some ambiguity about what actually happened. OK. So there, there's the trader abuse. There's this financial crisis problem. And then finally, there is the, uh, just this problem that uh, Dr. Bowman mentioned, which is that there seems to be, or someone, uh, maybe, uh, maybe Randy mentioned. But anyway, there's less lending, less interbank uh, lending going on now. And so there's less of a basis for uh, making these submissions. And so, uh, the, and the banks want to get out of LIBOR. Why do the banks want to get out of LIBOR? They're probably afraid of more of this legal exposure. I think that's really what's going on. If the banks were, were happy to continue with it, we might imagine that uh, the various people who use LIBOR would be fine with it. Wouldn't move on to SOFR, they just use LIBOR. Okay, so some lessons here. The risk of trader abuse, so this is a risk that every benchmark has, that, that traders, submitters, whoever's involved, and even market actors can take advantage of the existence of the benchmark. The benchmark creates leverage for manipulation that would, no, would uh, otherwise not exist. That's just a cost of having a benchmark. It may certainly be justified by the benefits of having a benchmark, but it may be it's the cost that the, that the parties that set up the benchmark might bear, right? And like the lighthouse, you know, they're benefiting the world with their benchmark, but if there's some manipulation, they might bear all the costs, okay? So this is, this is I think, a certain kind of, I don't know, instability or problem with the whole process of, of using uh, benchmarks. But much more significant than that type of risk, or you, could, or you could think of it as a more general risk, is the risk of unanticipated conditions. Okay, the financial crisis was not supposed to happen. It was impossible, according to another University of Chicago economist, also won a Nobel Prize. Uh, it wasn't supposed to happen. All right, it happened. Now I think we understand it could happen again. I think Randy rightly brought up the treasury markets, you know. Or we should be, be worried of maybe within 20 years that something could happen with them, which I think would be a pro problem for SOFR. Um, uh, could a, would a different benchmark have done better during the financial crisis? So that question was asked. Maybe, maybe it would have done better. But maybe it wouldn't have done better for a different type of financial crisis, right? We, we can't fight the last war. We have to somehow predict what a future crisis might look like and design our benchmark appropriately. You know, that's impossible, but it, it's a risk that one has to think about. Uh, okay. So this brings us to the question of the transition. 
And, and the, you know, the, the reason why I went through in some detail these scandals, the, the LIBOR scandal and the legal response, is I want to set the stage for thinking about the transition and the problems of uh, the transition. So the background law is actually pretty simple, uh, and some people have alluded to it already. The basic setup here is that you've got two people who've entered into a contract, and they're happy with the contract. They both make money off of it. But then, in the few, then, then some time passes, and the contract's still in effect, and some event happens, which totally undermines the purpose of the contract, puts one or both parties in an extremely uh, difficult position. Now, sophisticated parties will try to anticipate these sorts of events and put in their contract a uh, term that says what everybody's obligation is if you know, this future event occurs. The problem is it's incredibly difficult to anticipate uh, these sort of major uh, uh, catastrophic events in the future. So some people simply say nothing in their contract, right? The contract literally says nothing about what happens if there's some kind of catastrophic event. And sometimes, I think more commonly, sophisticated parties will put sort of vague clauses you know, if something bad happens, I don't know, the, the contract might be terminated or the parties might have an obligation to renegotiate. Um, sometimes these are called force majeure clauses. You've probably seen them. They usually say if war, hurricane, you know, depression strikes, all bets are off. They don't, that's not the legal language, but that's what it means. Um, the courts deal with this problem in, di in different types of ways. So there's this famous doctrine of frustration which is kind of, so when I teach it, I always use this case from 1903, um, which involved um, a guy who rents a, uh, a flat in, in London from another person because it has a good view of, a, of the a coronation parade for King Edward VII, and he wants to watch it. And, uh, but unfortunately, King Edward VII, like me, gets a cold, is unable to have his parade, the, the coronation parade is canceled. And so the guy who's renting the flat wants his money back. He says, well, the purpose of the contract was so that I could watch the coronation parade. That purpose was frustrated, and the court agrees with him. So he gets his money back. And that's what's going on here. It's that, you know, it's that case that lawyers are thinking about when you ask them what happens if LIBOR disappears and the contract doesn't say anything about it. So what will happen? So I think you know, one possibility, of course, is that LIBOR will not disappear. And I kind of wonder about this. If everybody is depending on LIBOR, uh, is there any way for them to pressure the banks? Do the banks not care uh, to, to keep it going? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but if, in any event, if the banks, if the, if the, it's not the British Bankers Association anymore, I guess, whatever the institution that announces uh, the LIBOR fix, if it just stops, you know, that's one possibility. That, so we should consider these different possibilities. One is that they just stop. So there's no LIBOR anymore. Another possibility is that they calculate LIBOR in a different way. Like they take SOFR and they say, okay, now this is LIBOR, or so, you know, some version of SOFR, and they say this is LIBOR. Uh, what would happen then? Well, what would happen would depend in part on uh, what people's contracts said, right? So Dr. Bowman was encouraging people to, as they enter into new uh, uh, contracts, financial contracts, to have some kind of fallback or to use a different reference rate. And if that's the case, the court will just enforce the new, the new term. I would say, though, that um, it may be very, very difficult, and I wish I had answers. I don't have answers. It may be very, very difficult to decide what should be in that, what that fallback rate should be. You want something that's economically equivalent to LIBOR, I guess, and I guess thought has been given to what that would be. But if you get it wrong, you know, there will be a, there will be a problem. The court will just go ahead and enforce this fallback term. If there's no fallback term, if the legacy contract says nothing, uh, it is likely, but not certain, that a court would just uh, hold that the contract is frustrated and that it's terminated. And that's the end. And I think normally what would happen, although the law is different in different places and there's always uncertainty, is that it would just be netted out, you know, as if the contract were terminated. So whoever is, you know, positive going forward would get money from the other, would be the other party. That would be normally what would happen if you just terminated uh, the contract. <clears throat> 
uh, this obviously would cause an enormous amount of disruption. There's, it is barely imaginable, but possible, that a creative, ambitious, um, and, and uh, aggressive court would try to reform the contracts. So what this would involve, I think, uh, especially if you know administrative agencies got involved and encouraged them to do, encourage the court to do that. But what this would involve would be that the court would actually rewrite the contract, and you could you could you could imagine this has never happened, but you could imagine a court just saying, "Look, the original contract is frustrated. Clearly, the parties that wanted to continue with a benchmark that's economically equivalent of, of LIBOR, let's get together and figure out what that is. And if the parties can neg renegotiate, that's fine. If they can't." You know, I'm just going to order it. And if there, you know, if there are thousands of parties, the renegotiation is basically impossible. Still, there are ways you can deal with it. You can have representatives. You can have the government. Uh, it's possible that a court could just order an economically equivalent bench, benchmark rate to take the place of LIBOR if LIBOR disappears. That probably would be the best outcome. But one wonders why regulatory agencies won't just step in and declare, OK, we're canceling LIBOR and we're replacing it with this new, better benchmark. And of course, the answer is they don't have the authority to do that. You know, maybe they should have some kind of authority to intervene when the private market in this way fails so badly. Uh, OK, let me conclude and, and take some questions. So quickly, first point, we should be aware that no benchmark is perfect. I, you hardly need me to tell you that. But the more important point here is that because of the way that benchmarks become entrenched as a result of this coordination problem among financial agents, a, a, very, a, a benchmark will get worse and worse and worse over the years, like the Arctic Circle, and, uh, and uh, people might be stuck with it. And this can create a significant problem. It's sort of like tectonic pressure, right? We don't, people continue using LIBOR. You don't really observe anything going on, but the pressure is building up underground, and at some point, there's an explosion. Uh, so what can we do about this? Well, obviously, when people design benchmarks, they should do that carefully. They should think about these things, think about these long-term risks. And people who use benchmarks in their contracts also have to think about these things, right? They need to put in fallbacks and safeguards uh, despite the risks that those uh, create. <coughs> the people who establish benchmarks also have to be aware of their potential liability, uh, as, I've, as I've emphasized. And we have to think more about whether the government, whether regulatory agencies should have a more active role, not only in sort of helping the market come up with benchmarks in the first place, but managing them as, as we go forward. And remember, it's the British authorities, I guess, who are maintaining LIBOR for the market for the time being. But they're not going to be able to do that indefinitely. So with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thanks, Mr. Krasner. Uh, just a question, I think, uh, for many of the people that are here, uh, you uh, being a legal expert, mm -hmm. would you rather defend a, uh, an index that just points at size uh, and says, look how massive we are. All four of us have decided this is the price. Or would you rather look at something that had better dispersion, where the size might not be as great, but you have 500 people that have traded something at that same price. Because I, I think that's, uh, at least that's the way I feel looking at uh, so for today. Here it is again. You look at the list of the people on the ARC committee. There are two uh, at least historically bad actors that are right there front and center. Uh, yeah, and the rest of us at the room are going, gosh, that, that, that's not us. We don't have a trillion. So I, I get, the question is simply, I think, about Building an index that is is meant uh, for less less vulnerability uh, versus one that has simply a larger number of participants, if not the same aggregate size. Right. I, I think the uh, I think the uh, from just a purely uh, legal perspective, which is not a business perspective, uh, the, to minimize uh, liability, you want to make it as mechanical as possible and as broad based as possible. So that that does push in favor of orienting your benchmark to the market. 
uh, when you say participants, I mean, you mean the, the people who actually invent the benchmark in the first place? Or, do you, or the people who set the number? Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. Versus uh. a thousand banks that will never get close to that size. Which one represents the market? Well, I guess it depends on, on which market you're. Okay. you're yeah. uh, <laughs> okay. I sense there's a subtext to this question, and I'm, I'm like you know, uh, like a rabbit that has sort of crept off the streets. Yeah, I, I, think yeah. I think that's where uh, a lot right. of friction comes. Right. I understand. I see that. Yes. No other questions. Uh, please join me.